It's a party in disarray. Some notable members are at each other's throat. Former Attorney General Martin Amidu and former Deputy Chief of Staff Dr. Valerie Sawyer are the two to most recently stage their own banter. Despite all this, however, the opposition in D.C. on Thursday launched its ideological institute, which is expected to help members better appreciate the ideals of the party, as well as possibly help them better relate with each other. Party Chairman Kofi Potofi touched on some of the things the school will be seeking to achieve, and he's confident it can help rid the party of elements that hinder its progress. There's more in this report. The event brought together appointees of former President John Dramani Mahama as well as leaders of the party. The establishment of the school forms part of efforts by the party to ensure that it's better organized before the 2020 polls. Chairman Kofi Potofi underscored the importance of the institution. We will all be glad when we return to power in 2020 to see that this time we will not have contradictions which accompanied our endeavors in the last four years. That's when we define what we stand for as a party, as a social democratic party, we will not have people who pull us back, whose undertakings will be unguarded. A governing council to be chaired by General Secretary Johnson Esiedu Nketia and a state's committee, administrative finance and academic affairs committee were also inaugurated. Delivering a keynote address, Johnson Esiedu Nketia highlighted some courses to be taught at the institution. Philosophy, principles and practice of social democracy. Two, Political economy and development. Three, elections and electoral systems. Four, gender mainstreaming. Five, youth development. Six, development and environmental sustainability. Grassroots political mobilization and activism. Public sector management public policy formulation and implementation, just to mention a few. The party has been in turmoil recently. This was evident when a journalist tried to ask a question about the founder of the party. Most times you see him on campaign field, there's one particular thing that mentioned, and that the NDC party has lost its ideology, what is stands for. Now, I think it's very, very important that this very occasion has been organized. So, if the NDC going back, if there's a need that something that they have lost to, you know, and uh, go ahead and look for all the things that NDC stand for, and then grow it into this very new that the party will get more energy as a party. The, the person who has a question about our founder, see, it is always very important that when you attend programs, programs of this nature, you listen. Listen very carefully. I'm sure if you have listened to the presentation, this question will not have come in at all. Member and one of the persons tipped to contest the flag bearers, Professor Joshua Labi, is confident the party will bounce back before the 2020 elections. We shall settle down and move on. I mean, normally when you have a problem, you fight a little and you settle and you move on. You watch and see. The party will be, the party will be very united. The party will be united very soon and you see a very strong NDC. We have this in every house. I mean, it happens. And determine the manner depends on where you come from. You follow? Yes. When you come from somewhere else, you determine the manner to be very, very bad. When you come from within, you also will accept the manner in a different way. But the bottom line is that this party is going to be very solid and we shall move as a united party to confront the issues. The institute will on August 25 organize its first training program for members. The crusade to retell Ghana's independence story and duly recognize all those who contributed on Thursday got the backing of a known in Chromaist, Convention People's Party member Dr. Vladimir Intridanso. 
the Crusaders argue that the contribution of Ghana's first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, to the independence struggle has been overemphasized to the neglect of other significant citizens. Speaking at a symposium organized by the Dankwa Institute here in Accra, Dr. Vladimir Chudansu, who is also the director of academic affairs at the Ghana Armed Forces Command Staff College, agreed, describing the existing historical account of the struggle as untrue. I'm an intellectual, first and foremost. I belong to the CPP tradition. And I know all about the CPP. The pros and the cons, the bad things, the good things. I know everything. I know the history of Ghana very well. And it would be bad on my part as an intellectual <coughs> to double in untruths. There can't be one founder to anything. I'm repeating what Professor Michael Quay said. Michael Quay didn't say anything untoward, anything that is not the truth. He said, we have found this. There were several fronts, all jeering towards one goal. Dankwa had his group. Uh, Pagrant had his group, everybody. And Pagrant was, was, was rich. He's a rich merchant who knows the political economy of the globe around that time. And he saw how much our riches were being just, you know, exploited. Dangwa, what do you think? Uh, no, you two, what do you think? They brought their minds together. The white man was telling us, if you don't have a political party, you can't govern yourselves. So they put themselves together, form a movement to engineer that line from the aborigines' right protection and earlier on, uh, Niboni, uh, what's the name? Nikomna Boni. And all, why are they lost in our history and we are only talking about Nkrumah? We'll reach a point when Nkrumah will be here. I hear he that. I remember where we were. We were very much indoctrinated. Not two ways about that. But it, so I, that's why I'm in a dive in the world Nkrumah is, you understand? But that doesn't mean Yesterday I was reading something about Nkrumahism, and they didn't tell us what Nkrumahism is, that the CPP, uh, what do you call it? The, they are this on the net. But they told, they didn't dis define what Nkrumahism was, but they said the principles of Nkrumahism. If we, the ifs. So if Pa Grant hadn't gathered the people and put his money there, where would our independence be? If there were no UGCC, would there have been an Nkrumah who knew him? Former Minister of State under the Kufa administration, Elizabeth Oheni, justified ongoing efforts to correct what she describes as a deliberate distortion of the historical account of Ghana's independence, citing the commemoration of September 21 as the birth date of Dr. Nkrumah. Our history was deliberately distorted by the victors of the independence struggle. It is time we faced up to it. Every part of the history of the victors, of the victors of the First Republic was written with an ideological slant. Does a retelling without that slant constitute rewriting? If the NPP now has the opportunity to add to the history by adding things that had been deliberately omitted because it did not suit the politics of the victors, so be it. If September 21st, 1909, is it, can be offered as a date for the celebration of the founder of Ghana, then of course it is an admission that our history is not based on fact. That date was not and cannot be the birthday of our first president. That 21st September date was a Tuesday. <laughs> President Kwame Nkrumah was not born on a Tuesday. He was probably born on a Friday, for he was known and called Kofi Nguya up until he went to the United States and then changed his name to Kwame Nkrumah. Nothing wrong with changing your name, but it goes to show that we have been changing our dates of birth for a long time. <laughs> A lecturer at the University of Ghana Political Science Department, Dr. Evans Agri Dakon, on his part, said Ghana's independence narrative cannot be complete if other actors who played crucial roles in the liberation struggle are not celebrated. The independence story 
would not be complete if we fail to acknowledge the relevance or the contributions of other actors, as even how the name even Ghana was adopted even at independence. There are some who argue that, look, when even in London or in the UK, JB was already researching into the origin, for instance, of the Akans, and even thought that the Akans were descendants of the, this glorious you know, Asian empire called Ghana. And therefore, his argument was that if there was this glorious past, then there is a tendency that we can still go back and recreate, reconnect, so that we can tap into that. Because when you are inspired, when you are energized, when your energies are aroused, it gives you hope for, for development and so on. Then the others who thought that, well, this is just a, um, um, an Asian something which existed somewhere, and therefore these people wanted to tap and um, use it for purpose of development and so on. But largely, I mean, people have talked about Goku's nationalism and so on, but the fundamental point is that there were several actors in the process. The Aborigines Rights Protection Society, with National Council, uh, what you call Congress for British West Africa, several other actors were working. Pa Grant himself had served under the Legislative Council, you know, under Gorgeous Beck. There were others, JB Danko and Co. You know, JB had represented even the ex servicemen as a legal advisor, legal counsel. He had represented the Eastern Territory Province on the Legislative Council between 1946 and then 1950. These were guys who really knew what they were about. They were not men and women of straw. They really knew what they were, were doing. We're hoping to bring you the views of some more in Chromaist on this Founders Day debate. But still ahead in the bulletin, former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan says it is time Ghanaians do away with the typical giving it all to God attitude. You have to help God a little bit for him to help you, or for her to help you. You can't leave it all to him. We have all of them more coming up, stay tuned. The member board of the Electricity Company of Ghana has been inaugurated and tasked with the responsibility of seeing through the handover of the company to a new private sector operator by the end of next year under the Millennium Challenge Compact signed with the U.S. Inaugurating the board, Energy Minister Boache Jaco mentioned a dip in staff morale as one of the major risks the board would have to confront, explaining that it could worsen the challenges ECG is already having to deal with. He however assured government would continue to own ECG's assets. Nancy MFA Jaduzi was at the Energy Ministry where a seven-member committee to investigate the bust of Spec Fuel Saga was also inaugurated. The Energy Minister told the board, chaired by Enterprise Group Chief Executive oh, Kelly Gajekpo, oh, it was important that they worked to improve ECG's fortunes before it is taken over by the new entity. One of the major risks identified during this transition period is the possibility of a dip in staff morale. If not checked, the lack, this lack of staff motivation threatens to worsen the challenges already confronting ECG. The board is expected to provide the right leadership, the needed incentives and innovations to improve the general performance of the company, especially increase in revenue collection and reduction in systems losses. The possibility of some workers of the state electricity distributor being laid off is one of the issues that has dogged the ECG PSP. The energy minister therefore used the opportunity to reassure the workers. Let me touch on labor issues and the need for change management as an integral part of the PSP process. The other members of the board are Kelly Gajekpo, Kalin Dokas Buchidi, Samuel Bwache Apia, Madame Mata Opare, Alhaji Amadou Kalim, Mr. John Kojo Akofo, Honorable Matthew Nindam, Odenohu Kweku Apia. 
The energy minister also inaugurated the committee tasked to investigate the contamination of fuel at the bulk oil storage and transport company Bost several weeks after it was announced. The Lawrence Dakwa committee, the minister noted, as to within a month produce a report on what led to the creation of the off-spec product. Review the procedures undertaken by Bost to evacuate the product, ascertain the quality and remaining quantity of the product, determine if the product can be corrected. If not, determine the alternative uses of the product, review the transaction. The committee is expected to advise the ministry on the necessary technical, administrative and legal actions to be taken. Dr. Lawrence Duck assured the minister the committee will do a diligent job. Lands and Natural Resources Minister John Peter Amewu has directed the Upper East Regional Minister to collaborate with the police and ensure that some three mining pits used by Galamse Mines Agmane are sealed. He said this will help prevent needless deaths and stop confrontations between the illegal miners and operators of Shangzi Mining, a mine support services firm working in the area. Mr. Amewu was on a tour of Mani in the Tanisi district of the Upper East Region. Correspondent Albert Sori reports. The Lands and Natural Resources Minister's visit to Bani was his first since he assumed office. The visit afforded him the opportunity to get a better understanding of the misunderstandings between local miners and the Shanji Mining Company. Briefing the Lands and Natural Resources Minister, Public Relations Officer for Shanji Mining, Maxwell Woma, explained the illegal miners have managed to create their own shafts underground that allow them access to the concession where Shanji Mining works. From the surface, they appear outside our concession. But when they enter these pits, they have cross cuts into our underground. All attempts to steal. These pits have been deepened, dangerously deepened, to our underground workings. And they use them as entry pits to the workings we have underground. In response, Lands and Natural Resources Minister John Peter Amewu directed Upper East Regional Minister Roxin Bukari to supervise the sealing of the pits. I have listened to your case carefully, and I'm directing that the regional minister, in collaboration with the regional commander of police, take immediate steps to make sure that they block those illegal shafts that have been used to invade this mine. He later went on a tour of the Shanji Mining Company and other mining areas at Bani. Officials of the Minerals Commission and security agencies reveal one of the underground pits connecting to the Shanji mine is located in this house. Speaking to journalists after his tour, Mr. Mewu expressed shock at what he discovered. The fact is also that uh, houses that we are seeing here, uh, illegal miners are able to duck, you know, create their own shafts to assess the whole bodies of this mining company. And so I think it's proper we take up the, uh, the matter. What the government keeps on saying day in, day out is a methodology that is adapted in the practices of the mining. That is what exactly we, uh, as a government, we are against. Touching on the directive given earlier for the Shanji Mining Company to suspend operations, Mr. Amewu revealed he will hold consultations on the issue and soon the mining company will be allowed to resume work. A community like this employing over 600, 700, you know, uh, workers, it's, it's quite significant. It adds up to the growth uh, trajectory that we, we're talking about. So uh, as, as <coughs> soon as possible, uh, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, talk with the Minas Commission, you know, the inspector of mine is here. We want to see the revamp of the mine and see how we can bring back those workers, you know, to, 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 to job. The Deputy Minister of Interior, Henry Quarty, says the wheels of justice will not be obstructed. And the suspect who shot a mechanic at a garage at Alajo here in Accra will face a full rigors of the law. Mr. Quarty, who is also the MP for Yasso Central, also urged the mechanics not to take the law into their own hands. He further promised to bear the cost of the final funeral rights of the deceased. We cannot take the law into our own hands. There are agencies mandated by law to ensure that the lives and properties of persons and citizenry in this country are protected. To this end, I shall continue 
to humbly appeal to you to be law abiding and not to take the law into your own hands. The law will take its course. Every, every, every citizen, every person in this country is entitled to free, fair, and an equal opportunity. And so I want to re-emphasize the point that the laws of this country will take its course. I want to humbly appeal to you to allow due process to take its course. Now, the mechanic was on Tuesday shot at Alajo after an altercation of a parking space. He had already passed on after doctors could not repair the extensive damage he suffered to his internal organs. Now, immediately, the, his colleague mechanics got to know that he had passed on on Wednesday nights. They besieged the frontage of Joy FM on Thursday to protest and demand that justice is served. We know that Yap Wedding, a 32 year old mechanic, on Tuesday was shot at a mechanic warehouse at Alajo. Now, today, news we've gotten is that yes. Yap Wedding has passed on. He died at the Greater Accra Hospital in the late hours of Wednesday evening. Now, what we've gathered, as far as the medical report is concerned, is that his right kidney was hit so hard and so that it had to be removed. His colon was also hit so it had to be cut and joined. He lost so much blood, over 12 pints of blood was lost and had to be pumped back into his system. All of that were done, but the young man couldn't survive. He's passed on. And colleague workers at the garage are here. Can you hear me? And all they want is justice. I get the news yesterday evening, night around 8 o'clock, that I get the news that my brother passed away. Actually, I couldn't sleep the whole night. So today we wake up and we say that no. We hear that they are doing the case, police case, that uh, the person is Nana, Nana child, Nana person, so bodyguard. So we don't know. We know that when we come to you, media, we will get the result that we need. That's why, and you people were there yesterday, the day that the accident happened. You were there. So we know that when we get to you, you hear the you know, Nana himself who will hear, who will listen to us, who know what happened. So that people use his name to patrol and kill people around. That maybe his mind is not there, he's not with his mind, but people are killing people just like that. I'm said new thing. Yesterday evening, around 6 o'clock, we called a guy's phone, and the guy responded. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I know that if someone is in custody, he is not supposed to receive call, which means the guy has been released. So we are very, very, very angry this morning. In fact, receiving the call, confirming to us that he is still out. So you think the case is going nowhere? No, we, are, we, we, we don't think the case, the case is going nowhere. But our angry is that the whole country to support us, to support justice. It's painful. This kind of boy doesn't talk a lot. And don't even, since I was in that yard, it was 20 years now. I don't see that boy agree with somebody else. But why? Why should he come like that? Look at that scene. What happened? Three days today. And very, very unfortunately, non-fat.
What I can say, because looking at Mayor Mahama and looking at police people that has been doing, and looking at boy that has been for sighting Phoenix in what. Well, the police have since told us that the suspect has been charged with murder and that he is in custody. They actually indicated that he was remanded to police custody after he was sent to court on Wednesday. You're still watching Journey's Prime here. We're taking a break. We'll bring you business news thereafter. Stay tuned. Hello everyone, welcome to Business on Join News Prime. Now, the Finance Minister Ken Ofriata has promised to clear all debts owed banks by next month. The assurance comes as government finalizes movement of state funds to the Bank of Ghana. The Finance Ministry, together with the Controller and Accountants General's Department, has more than 3,000 accounts out of the 17,000 estimated. Government estimates that more than 5 billion cities is logged in these accounts. The banks, on the other hand, have argued that going ahead with this policy would affect their operations unless government pays all it owes them. But speaking to Joy Business at the official launch of the single treasury account policy, Ken Oferia Atta tells Joy Business that government is committed to addressing the concerns of the banks. Yeah, it's to begin to pay some of the arrears, which are to various um, clients that they have, and hopefully that will help mitigate that. Um, and so that's that's a key issue that, that we are doing right now. And then we are also expecting that once we also successfully launch the energy bond, that would also go to clear the energy areas which are important too. In terms of the, the payment that we are releasing, we are releasing them, you know, as of the beginning of September, even a little earlier actually. Yeah. How far has any sector bond gone? I knew that you gave the, the banks by the close of August. How far have they gone in raising all the funds? No, we haven't launched it yet. We were in, in London um, doing a mini Roadshow, and then next week we'll also meet um, the investment community uh, in in the country um, to do that. Before we will then um, actually um, zero in on the actual structure um, for that to be issued. Uh, but so far the interests have been fairly strong, and we are comfortable that when we do launch it by the end of August, we should be able to mobilise, um, God willing, before end of September. Fresh estimates put the energy sector debts at around 2.5 billion Ghana cities. Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ernest Atson, has downplayed any negative impact to the implementation of the Treasury Single Account on the operations of the banks. We do not expect that it would have any major impact. Uh, the data that we looked at suggested that only seven banks, only seven banks had about 10% uh, of their total deposits as government deposits. Uh, the central government funds with the commercial banking system is just about 1.2 billion. This is the first phase of the implementation. It's not a big amount of money. Maybe the public enterprise funds, which is estimated at about 3.1 billion, might be a little bit more uh, large in terms of the movements from the public enterprises account. But we think that this is very manageable. Uh, I want to encourage our colleagues, bankers here, to support this very important uh, government policy initiative. And let's all make the TSA work. The Treasury Single Account is expected to support government efforts to enhance efficient management of public funds, as it would consolidate all government accounts into one single account. Banking consultant and former MD of Amal Bank, Mensin Tokonu, has called on the Bank of Ghana to ensure risk-based auditing is carried out on banks. This, according to him, would help ensure that banks are in good standing. His comments come as uh, the central bank assures it has no plans of liquidating two banks said to be in distress. I think most of the banks have very good uh, risk uh, uh, or let me put it this way, uh, employees who are risk, uh, they know what the risk is all about. And every, every bank has that. They have very good risk departments. 
You know, so I think Bank of Ghana has to, ch to check whether the so-called risk-based uh, auditing that is being done nowadays is being carried out and make sure that they follow the regulated procedure that has been laid down by Bank of Ghana. Mm. One of the key things that we're looking at the policy rate. And uh, I, I think they're also going to be looking at uh, the new capital for banks. Uh, but I think one of the things also they should also look at is um, um, the, um, the value of money that is being kept with the, the liquidity rate. They should look at the liquidity rate. If, if they increase the, um, the minimum capital, then I would advocate that they should release uh, the liquidity rate that uh, banks keep with uh, the central bank, because that will become money available to be able to uh, do business with. In other news tonight, U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Robert Jackson, is warning of a possible decline in foreign direct investments, especially from his country by the end of the year if bribery and corruption in the public sector is not dealt with. Government is advancing moves to establish a special prosecutor's office to care the phenomenon. Ambassador Jackson, however, believes government needs to do more before the menace takes a toll on the economy. I believe that President Kufuado and his government are committed to changes. They've made a lot of encouraging statements. The special prosecutor bill has finally been introduced. Right to education, right, right to information bill has been in and out of parliament. If those acts are passed and if we see uh, greater emphasis on making certain that investment processes, land titling, things that are related to investment move quickly, I think you will see a great uptick in investment here. But it's a competitive environment. Ghana cannot just do things and expect everyone else around it to stand still. One of the reasons that Ghana's investment ranking has declined in the World Bank's doing business indicators is not only because Ghana has, is not just because Ghana's not been doing anything, it's because other countries have been moving faster. Ghana needs to catch up and get ahead catch up and get ahead. In that case, you still have your businesses, American businesses here working. How are they dealing with it? Does it mean that they're paying their way through as well? American businesses by U.S. law are not allowed to pay bribes or facilitation fees. They can lose substantial assets, face prison in the United States if they are found to have paid bribes. What I find American companies do as a result, if they're worried about it, is go to other markets. But the world is a competitive place. You go where you see the greatest opportunity. That said, in my 18 months here, we've had nine American companies invest here. There is clear interest. There will be more interest if the government helps to get the environment right. Now, government has been challenged to establish an independent body to promote transparency and accountability in the management of mining revenues in Ghana. A 2017 Resource Governance Index report ranked Ghana's mining sector 24th out of 89 countries, it says. While Ghana's young oil and gas industry plays 13th out of 89, it was the best performing industry in sub-Saharan Africa. Government revenue from mining uh, has declined, beating proceeds from the oil and gas industry despite the over 100 years track record in mining. This resulted in the need for a body like PIAC to oversee revenues generated in the sector. Prince Apia has more in this report. A 2017 Resource Governors Index report ranked Ghana's mining sector 24 out of 89 countries assessed. Mining scored 37 out of 100 points, whilst oil and gas rated 65 out of 100 points in revenue management. Kwame Jantua, who is Vice Chairman of Public Interest and Accountability Committee, believes challenges in the sector could be addressed if an oversight body is in place.
very well with mining. So we need to now look at mining strongly. And if we even have to start with a PIAC, Revenue Management Act, Exploration Act for mining, to bring it back to where oil and gas is, would be fantastic. Key things that PIAC has been able to do for the oil and gas sector is the fact that it started with the sector. From the, from the onset of the sector, PIAC was also birthed. So all the steps that the oil industry has taken, PIAC has taken the same. With the mining industry, it's different. 100 years of mining. Um, we do not have the world with all and the capacity to do it. And so if we're going to do that, you would need a PIAC of mining techni technical people. Yes, we can share notes. Even today, you find that some of the things that have happened in the mining industry, we haven't learned in the oil industry. We're now gradually trying to share notes to see how best we can make the, the oil and gas industry 100%. But yes, we need to do that for the mining sector because the mining sector gives Ghana a lot of revenue. And from the NDPC, looking at the kind of minerals we have in the ground today, if we don't get a good mining law in place or good mining laws that would cover mining, it's going to be very difficult. And that's all in business. The news continues after this break. Former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan says the overly polite and respectful nature of the African could be blamed for a number of the continent's problems. He says the non-confrontational attitude the African is noted for has been exploited, especially by leaders who have maintained a hold on power even after their constitutional mandate has expired. Kofi Annan, who was speaking at an interaction dubbed An Afternoon with Kofi Annan, organized by the Infantipim Old Boys Association, said several countries on the continent have seen their leaders employ both legal and illegal means to extend their regime for decades. You cannot convince me or any ordinary people that in a nation of millions of people, only one person can lead that nation and nobody else is qualified uh, to do this. And the problem is also they don't create an environment that allows potential uh, leaders to emerge. They create an atmosphere where anyone who emerges gets his head chopped off. And in the end, they keep telling you, we have to continue because I'm being told by the people, what happens when you leave? Who is going to take over? So they make themselves indispensable and use that to stay on. You know, and this spirit of not allowing younger leaders and others to emerge is a real problem on the continent. But I would also say that we as Africans are sometimes too tolerant, uh, too tolerant, uh, too respectful, and some leaders abuse those qualities. He also criticized the lethargic attitude of the Ghanaian towards changing the environment for the better, found in the popular expression, give it to God. People often ask me, what do you have to do to become a, a, a good global citizen, a good leader? I said, no, it starts in your community. It starts in your home. It starts in your village. It starts in your school. If something is wrong, get together with a group of friends and correct it. Get organized and do something about it. I, I, uh, I, I think religion in its purest form is education in social morality. All the major religions teach us to be merciful, to be kind, don't kill. And so there are lessons that can help in our life. There is a tendency here, though, in our society, which I, I will comment briefly on, when I come home, I often I talk to people, the, particularly the older generation you discuss, and I say, Chimanyami, leave it to God. And I always tell them, yes, it's good to believe in God and to leave it to God. But you have to help God 
a little bit for him to help you or for her to help you. You can't leave it all to him. <laughs> a Deputy Minister of Information, Perry Curtis Okujato, has stated that Ghana's democracy could be strengthened and the national development agenda could flourish if citizens are actively engaged and abreast with government policies and programs. He assured government's preparedness and commitment to continue getting the ordinary Ghanaian involved in the decision-making process. Perry Kujatu was addressing a town hall meeting organized by the Ministry of Information in collaboration with the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development for the Sunyani West District Assembly at Udumasi. Nestor Kafuya Juma Sating for joining us. The town hall meeting offered the opportunity for the people of Sunyani West to get more information on current government policy, programs and social interventions which affect their lives. The people also had the chance to know what the district assembly is doing to better their laws. Perry Okujetu said government is constantly reminded of what is important to the people of the various localities. Hence, they have instituted the town hall meeting to be held across the country. We have initiated what we call the town hall. And at these town hall meetings, we expect participation from stakeholders within the district, Nananum, well, and also ordinary citizens in the district in order for us to first of get government to present to you the different policies that affect our lives individually. Get you to also comment on what your thinking is on these policies. It also presents an opportunity at the local level for the district assembly to also present to you citizens within the locality the things that locally district assemblies are doing in addition to what policies central government is seeking to use to drive the development agenda of our nation. The Deputy Information Minister urged the various assemblies to get their unit committee members to replicate the town hall meetings in their respective areas. I will also encourage that our unit committee members, who are also members of the decentralized local assembly, take a cue from what government has initiated and brought to the assembly level for us to be able to also hold smaller meetings within our unit committees so that whatever is said here can be sent down to the lowest level within the assembly concept. District Chief Executive of Sunyani West, Martin Obing, appealed to the citizenry to embrace the town hall concept for development. Nestor Kafui Ajome's report. Time now for a quick look at our top stories here on Joy News Prime. Deputy Interior Minister and Member of Parliament for Yawasu Central Henry Quarter has assured the suspect who fired the shot which eventually killed a mechanic in his constituency will be made to face the full rigors of the law. The assurance came after his colleague mechanics at Aladio March to the Multimedia Broadcast Centre after it emerged the shooting victim who was undergoing treatment at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital had died. The National Democratic Congress has launched its ideological institute to help its members better appreciate the ideals of the party, but it got confronted with a raging controversy about its founder. Well, on the matter of the story of Ghana's independence, known in Kuma as Dr. Vladimir Introdanso has endorsed the crusade to change the existing narrative. In business, Finance Minister promises to clear all debt owed banks by next month as government finalizes movement of state funds to the Bank of Ghana. And former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan says it is time Ghanaians do away with a typical give it all to God attitude. Now there are no accurate statistics of persons learning 
with disability, persons learning with disabilities uh, learning in Ghana. That's according to Deputy Minister of Education, Dr. Yao Ose Educhum. His position is corroborated by American Ambassador Robert P. Jackson. Elsewhere, special needs education is of high priority to education officials in the state as a whole. The American Embassy today swore in 22 Peace Corps volunteers, majority of whom will be supporting special needs education in Ghana for the next two years. Gifty and Apia was there in our report. John F. Kennedy Bay, Asiwo Kata, Meso O, Gake, Ehia Bay, Suku Dede Fe, Monopopo, Nasu. Those are Americans proving they have qualified to be Peace Corps volunteers in Ghana, operating at the grassroots. Over 5,000 of them have already lent their quota, though unquantifiable, to both Ghana's development and U.S.-Ghana relations. After 10 weeks of training, their charge is to wage peace. Through your actions and attitudes, your service and your kindness to others, you will show that Americans care about Ghana and are committed to work side by side with Ghanaians for the long term. So I challenge you today, wage peace, make a difference, one person at a time. The Education Ministry is extending a comforting arm of welcome through Deputy Education Minister Dr. Yawase Educhum. When you commit yourself to the work that is ahead of you, you leave the rest to Providence. One day you're going to find yourself in a place where you say it was because of my Peace Corps work in Ghana. That is why I'm here today. And always know that the Ministry of Education is happy to have you here. They will be deployed to classrooms in various parts of the country to support teaching and learning, but of high priority is students with special needs. Ambassador Jackson blames the difficulty in identifying special needs students in Ghana on the size of classrooms. We've been able to identify the deaf students, the, the students with, with vision problems. Those who have behavior problems or need a little extra support are harder to identify because of large classroom size, but we're working with the ministry. As the Ministry of Education welcomed the support of the Peace Corps volunteers, what is the ministry itself doing about the disturbing situation? The plan is that we'll be able to scale up assessment centers. We'll be able to teach teachers so that they can identify students with learning disability. You know, and also we are now reforming our teacher education curriculum. So a part of the new curriculum that we're going to implement, teachers will have a course in special education. So that when the child sits in front of them and the child is not doing well, the child will be supported, the child will be assessed, and the IEP will be prepared for the student. Even though statistics are unavailable, one can envisage the number is huge, as schools for the blind and deaf are only starting point. The volunteers are poised to change lives one person at a time. The Peace Corps volunteering program is 56 years in Ghana, focusing on various sectors, including agriculture, education and health. Contrary to criticisms that the program fosters American propaganda, Ambassador Jackson says its main aim is to broker mutual understanding and simply a part of U.S. investment in education. Kifti Andopia, Joy News, Accra. Research by the Africa Center for International Law and Accountability, ASILA, in May 2017 established that key reasons for the tendency of a convicted criminal to reoffend include lack of a support system for ex-convicts when they return home to their families, ex-convicts lacking knowledge or skills to enable them to get a job and reintegrate into society, discrimination against ex-convicts, and stigmatization. Facing these challenges, nearly a quarter of ex-convicts relapsed into committing crime and going back to prison. Clearly, this represents both a challenge and an opportunity. It is to contribute to addressing these challenges at the Africa Center for International Law and Accountability, ASILA, a nonprofit organization, seeks to undertake a project aimed at reducing the rate of recidivism through provision of knowledge and skills for smooth integration into society. ASILA has, in furtherance of this, presented a check of over 10,000 CDs to the Senior Correction Center for inmates to sit for the NVTI exam. Executive, Executive Director William Nyako says the Africa Center for International Law and Accountability also intends to provide legal aid for inmates of the institution. One of the uh, problems that the 
criminal justice system actually faces, and this also includes especially the, the prison service, is how do you uh, reintegrate those who have finished serving their sentence back into society? Um, and some of the problems we've seen with, with this aspect of it is that um, when some of these uh, unfortunate ex-convicts go back, there's difficulty with uh, reintegrating into society, there's stigmatization and of course discrimination, and also that they don't have any skills uh, which they would use uh, to get a living. Uh, so um, the Africa Center for International Law and Accountability uh, with our partner, Third Dimension uh, Institute, thought that this was an area that we should uh, focus some attention on. Um, we are doing a number of things, uh, three main areas, uh, you know, providing legal aid uh, for the indigent who might find themselves in court, and also providing skills and knowledge uh, to prisoners. Uh, also, uh, one of the other aspects we are doing is providing uh, the basic needs of inmates uh, when they are in. We did a donation to secondary female prisons uh, uh, in June. Uh, these were provided them with a lot of, uh, you know, amenities that they would use, um, you know, on a daily basis. And of course, the third part is this one, uh, helping to provide skills that they need so that when they go out, they will be able to reintegrate into society. Our uh, presentation of the check of uh, 10,000 Ghana, uh, 137 uh, cities and 50 pesos is in recognition of helping um, juvenile inmates. Now we are able to provide uh, for the registration of 45 juvenile inmates uh, so that they can sit for the uh, NVTI exam in many areas, carpentry, uh, organizing, uh, and, and several other areas which uh, when they leave, they will be able to use these skills uh, and get into a society and prevent recidivism, which is reoffending and coming back uh, here or going uh, to adult prisons. Meanwhile, Dire Deputy Director of Prisons, Chris Lavi, who received the check on behalf of the Institute, is worried some inmates do not continue and complete whatever program they are enrolled on because when they finish serving, the system is not strong enough to monitor the beneficiaries. They all come with sentences. Some come six months. The maximum is three years, six months. Somebody comes, he wants to go to school, but his sentence is only one year. What do you do to him? Because we start you, we will not even finish to write the BC. So those ones we call, we term the hanging. Some even finish. They, they pass very well. We we'll get admission placement for them in the secondary schools, Kizito, a few secondary schools around. But he will do only one year. His sentence is exhausted. So what do we do? You have to get transfer to them to wherever they are coming from. And that is also a serious difficulty because they go and they don't go to the school. They even their parents, you call them, they think that once they are here, they belong to government. Meanwhile, even the payment of the school fees, we have to get people to take up the school fees payment. Now the person is leaving on transfer to probably Asamankesi. Do you still have to ask the person to be paying well in Asamankesi? We all agree that the parents who should take over, but they also tell us that no, they don't have, they just don't have. Uh, so we release them, they go and the monitoring is not done properly. Some, they will not even complete. Not, and it, no, it's not the fault is not theirs, but because of the background of who pays my school fees. Uh, so those are the, we have the same thing with the, the trade areas to, here we do the MVTI one and two. Some to you do the one, you do the first one, you go before the second one. Some you are just about writing the second one, then your term expires. Then at times we have to ask them to go and come back. We have to uh, probably, probably register them before, so they come back to write. And the way that they go and practice or not, it's supposed to be for social welfare in the community that will handle that. So, but for now, I always stop at the end here. When they are going, we refer them to community centers for them to, whether they do it properly or not, because we, we don't go there. So the, the reformation and the rehabilitation end 
is here, but the reintegration is a bit off from our hands. The Brahman chief of Pasa traditional area, Ubo Tessan Konja the Six, has organized an interdenominational three day power packed prayers crusade to pray and seek for God's intervention in the development of the area. Ubo Tessan Konja the Six, who was troubled by the underdevelopment of his area, told Joy News he was directed by God to bring indigents together to pray for forgiveness of their sins and ask for development for the Pasa traditional area. Fred Kwamiasara's report. Pasa traditional area in the Nkwanta North District is undoubtedly one of the poorest districts in the Volta region. The area is bedeviled with thieving challenges ranging from bad roads, lack of health facilities, poor educational infrastructure, among others. Though traditional authorities in the area have appealed to government on several occasions on their predicaments, little has been done to that effect. However, according to the Paramount Chief of Baza, Ubor Tazan Konja the Sith, the area is lagging behind in development because indigents have sinned against God and fallen short of his glory, hence the crusade. He expressed optimism the area will soon start seeing signs of development after the crusade and admonished his colleague traditional rulers to accept Christianity and desist from entrusting their lives and rulership in smaller gods. We, the people of Pasa, we are not worshipping him the way he wants us to be. Let's take it that we are into sin, violent, thing that he, God, is not played with. So I asked him, God, what should I do? And the answer is to organize the people of Pasa so that we come together, we pray, ask for forgiveness. After, he will restore all that has been lost and he will forgive our sin. And I believe very well that three days today, this could say have been begun. So I know and what has happened there, the wonders and signs that we have experienced there, I know God has restored Pasa. And from today onwards, Pasa is a peaceful town. Pasa is a lovely town. Pasa could develop. The district chief executive, Jackson Kwame Jakai, lauded the chief's role in ensuring the area sees development, while government also plays its part to elevate the district. Uh, it is the purpose is to bring all men of God together, as well as people of God. Christians or of every denomination together just to pray for peace, development, and uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 unity for the community. And that is the uh, This is not the first time, it's about, uh, about two or three times you have done this. Uh, it is seriously uh, 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 for peace, unity, development, and also uh, what do you call it, tranquility to exist. A spiritual leader, Greece Asino, who led prayers to break the shackles of underdevelopment, urged all traditional authorities to emulate Ubor Tazan Konja's initiative and seek salvation for their respective areas, adding, the end time is near. Fred Kwame Asari's report for Joy News. That's it. My name is Ujel. I have a good night. is Joy News Prime.